John chapter number 12. John chapter number 12. Verse number 20. John 12 and 20. Egging me on, Jarvis. Where you lead me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him all the way. Hallelujah. Where he leads me, I will follow. It's uncomfortable sometimes, but where he leads me, I will follow. Even when I don't understand where he leads me, I will follow. Oh, yeah, I'll go with him, with him all. Some through the water and some through the flood, some through great fire, but all through the blood. <laughs> some will have to go through grace trial, but God will give you a song and it's in the night seasons hallelujah and all the day long Woo. now there were certain Greeks among those and as you stand in deference to the reading of the word today now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip who was with, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee and asked him saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. More assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground, it dies. And dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me where I am. There my servant will be also. And if anyone serves me, him my father will honor. So Father, Scripture, he's a mighty God. I want to talk for the next little while from the subject with my attention wrapped upon verse number 24. So I'll reiterate it. More assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit, much grain. I want to talk for the next little while from this subject. If you don't mind, type it in the chat and share it with everyone around you. Just look at them and tell them, let it die. Let it die. Let it die. Tell somebody else, let it die. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus has a brilliant command of the science of nature and the process of life. His language, every now and then it'll peep, he'll peep it out and we'll see that he is the master of science. He's the master of all of these things that people grapple with while philosophers are sitting around trying to find the meaning of life and while scientists are trying to figure out how to 
to, to, to manage things. Jesus seems to be the absolute genius at the science of nature. The paradoxical statement that Jesus makes as he communicates his suffering, his imminent suffering and death is interesting to me in the text because he says in this particular place after uh, the Greeks wanted to see him, they wanted to have an audience with him and you know, they, they say to Philip, uh, can you hook us up, man? We want to have a, a, a time with him. And Philip gets with his brother Andrew and they go to Jesus and Jesus doesn't even seem to flinch at the offer nor does he seem to even acknowledge their request. He jumps right in and says, my hour has come. He, he says, the hour has come. The hour has come. The precise moment in purpose has arrived. You know, I discovered that it is one thing to be thinking about something, it is one thing to be talking about something, it is another thing when that hour, that moment actually hits. Anxiety goes through the roof. You can be talking about something for months. You know, ladies, when y'all are preparing to get married, every day is a conversation about a dress, a flower, a meal, a, a, a roll. I mean, you know, it's always this conversation about that day, and it would seem to me that after all of those talks and after all of those um, discussions and everything being prepared, there would be no nervousness. But it is really human nature to become nervous and full of anxiety when the moment arrives. Jesus is preparing. These are the last days of his earthly assignment and he senses that he is close now to the moment and to the purpose from which he was to which he was born. And he has to deal with the anxiety, but at the same time, he has to deal with the whew, it's almost over. I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but I want to he says the hour has come where the Son of Man will be what? Glorified. Mm. How do you call suffering and death glorification? He says the Son of Man must be glorified. Who calls trials glory? Who calls getting beat glory? Who, who, who says death is glorious? He said. But this is the moment where the Son of Man will be glorified. Uh, because here is the lesson. Here is the point. You can never experience glory without experiencing suffering. We love the idea of glory. We don't like the idea of suffering. But there can be no glory without any suffering. For I reckon, Paul says, that the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared with the glory. You got it. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, don't miss your moment of glorification for fear of the process. Many of us right now, God wants to do so much more in us, but we won't submit to the process because I want to tell you that the process is not pretty. The process is ugly. The process is painful. The process is lonely. The process is confusing. The process is beyond anything that anybody signs up for. I don't know anybody who has experienced glory that just signed up and says, sign me up for the Christian problems. No, 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 we like the Jubilee, but we don't like the problems. And, and the only way to really 
be, for God's glory to be manifested in your life is you got to go through the process, but we are afraid of the process. Maybe y'all are not. But I've never, ever not been afraid of a process when I understand uh, what goes in it. And that's why God, when he calls you to something, that's why God, when he is determined to bless you, he promises to bless you, but he leaves out the details. And the reason why he leaves out the details is because he knows if you knew what you had to endure, you would not sign up. You, he says, he says, David, I'm anointing you king. I'm anointing you king. I'm anointing you king. You're going to be king over Israel. You're going to sit on the throne after Saul abdicates the throne, you are going to sit here because this is where I have placed you. But he never tells David that Saul would make 21 attempts on his life. Okay. He never tells him that 21 times his mentor would become his nemesis. Never tells him that the one who was training him, the one who was responsible for mentoring him and bringing him to a greater place would be the one that turns on. You have not been turned on until you've been turned on by people who you pour yourself into. You have not been hurt until you've been hurt by people that you love. People always talk about church, but it ain't church that hurts you. It's people. I got church hurt. Yeah, don't make no ridiculous statement like that. There's people in the church. And just like there's people on your job. Uh, it's just like people in your family. And just like you've been, you have been hurt by people, people have been hurt by you. Why y'all ain't talking now? So let's 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 get let's, let's clear that up. We don't like the process because it is painful. It is interesting here that Jesus, in his wise genius, says the hour has come for me for the Son of Man to be glorified, and then he goes right into this agricultural or botanical metaphor. He says, he says, unless. A corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies. It abides alone. But if it dies, in other words, if it is buried, and again, he is talking about, metaphorically, he is really referring to his death. If it just falls to the ground, it will die alone. But if it is buried, oh, if... If it is buried in the ground, it's going to produce. If it just falls to the ground, it dies and it dries up and it's alone. Uh, let me try it this way. If it just falls to the, to the ground and there is no burial, if there is no hiding, if there's no season of obscurity if there's no darkness if there is no um, isolation it just dies alone but in order for you I mean the seed to produce the harvest it must go through the season of darkness it must go through the season of isolation it must go through a season of obscurity don't think it's strange when you find your life in seasons of darkness. Darkness is necessary. If you're ever going to be productive, you're going to have to go through some dark seasons. Why are y'all not hollering? If, it's, if you're really going to be productive and be all that God would call you to be, be and purpose for you to be before the foundation of the world, you're going to have to deal with isolation. You're going to have to deal with obscurity where nobody sees you and you have to develop in darkness. 
Yes, you have to just be okay with sometimes being in pain and nobody knowing it. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, deliver me from people who are narcissistic and everybody's got to know everything all the time and woe is me all the time. When you are really God's anointed and when you really have been purposed by God, you have to be okay with pri- with crying in private. You have not matured until you can go through pain in private. Oh, boy. I don't, ain't talking to the right people. You know when you're growing in God, when you can suffer in silence. Because there's nobody to call. There's really nobody to talk to. There's nobody that really understands. There's nobody that needs to know. Because if you tell them, they can't do anything about it in the first place. If you tell them all your problems, you empower them. I have learned you do not tell all the secrets of your heart because you empower your enemies when you you think they're your friends. But sometimes you are empowering enemies when you talk too much. Even about how you honestly feel, they will use it against you. Mm, that's why the old saint said it like this just a little talk with Jesus I wish I could talk to somebody just a little talk with Jesus will make it right just just a little talk with him Mm. Uh, uh, when you pray go in your secret closet and close the door behind you Hallelujah. Turn up the TV real loud just in case you, uh, you don't want to be overheard and, and have a little talk with it. And the Father who heareth you in secret will reward you openly. Jesus. Jesus talks now and he uses this botanical analogy and he says, unless this corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, uh, It's going to produce more fruit. Jesus is now talking about the process of germination. He's he's referring to now germination. (laughs) He starts talking about what happens in germination. The sprouting of a seed spore or a a, a reproductive body after a period of dormancy. What is needful in germination is water, time, chilling and cool temperatures and even warm temperatures, light, oxygen. All of these elements initiate the process. Hmm. So a seed falls to the ground and it's got to be watered. A seed falls to the ground and you got to give it time. <laughs> a seed falls to the ground and it's got to go through the process of being in cold temperature. Then it's got to go through the process of warming temperature. Now why is that need? Why is the hot and the cold necessary? Mm, I'm glad you asked, even if you did. Because the cold, the winter, kills the germ. The reason why you and I go through seasons of winter is because God, even in nature, it kills off germs. But isn't it interesting that after um, winter comes spring, because now it gradually warms up so that that which is released in it can sprout out. And all the while, one of the constants of every season is water. Uh, y'all not going. Y'all, I'm going to get to the good part in a minute. I'm, I'm really almost finished. But um, it's water. And, and one of the other constants of, uh, of germination is light. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me deal with this. Because the reality is light is necessary. Light is necessary, water is necessary, and I'm going to talk about them in a minute. But one, the other thing that's interesting about a seed to me is that it has two different types of coats. It has two coats. It has a thick coat and a thin coat. Um, um, Why does a seed have a coat? Because, I'm glad you asked, even if you didn't. Um, 
the thick coat, the seed that has a thick coat. Um, why do they have a coat? Because the reality is that the life is in the seed. And the life of the seed is inside. It's an embryo. Uh, the seed contains an embryo. And life is inside of the seed. Your problem is you are judging people from the outside. Oh, let me get, let me get back here. We judge things from the outside. And we don't understand that the essence of who you are is not on the outside, it is on the inside. And so some seeds, uh, ladies and gentlemen, like um, beans have thick coats. Um, and the reason why um, there's a distinction because thick coats uh, allow the seed to germinate slower. The process is slower and they are less permeable. In other words, they are not easily to be penetrated. They, they don't die easy. They, they can withstand things. A thick coat can withstand stuff. Mm. Y'all going to get this later? A thick coat can withstand stuff. A thick coat. Uh, a thick coat may take longer to germinate. A thick coat may take longer to come alive. A thick coat watches everybody else's season while they still in hiding. A thick, <laughs> you got to have thick skin to be germinated. You got, you got to go through and watch everybody else come out and realize that it's just not your season. A thick coat continues to get nourished, but they don't budge. What do you do when you buried the seed and you planted the seed of your life and ain't nothing happening. What do you do when nothing's going on in your life? Oh boy, I'm not lecturing. What do you do when you've got to watch everybody else get blessed? And it seems like instead of getting blessed, you are getting cursed. It seems like God has seemingly forgotten all about you. Everybody else is pr praising God over a new house, a new car, a new job, and you are still in the ground. And then there are seeds with thin coats. They, they germinate much quicker, much faster, but they are also more vulnerable and susceptible to crushing. Uh, they, they don't last. They, they are vulnerable because all you got to do is run over it and the seed is destroyed. Uh, all you got to do is just um, uh, push it up against something and the seed is destroyed. You can crack it in your hand. The seed is destroyed. All you got to do is talk about them and they are crushed. Y'all still think I'm talking about a seed on the ground. All you got to do is don't like them. And, 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 okay. All you got to do is roll your eyes. And all you got to do is say a little things about it. You know when you got thick skin. Because you can hear it and still keep going. Why y'all ain't talking to me? You know when you got thick skin. When God gives you thick skin. The reason why he gives you thick skin. Because he's taking you to a greater height. And you're going to produce more going to produce more. So you got to go through longer. Uh, you got to endure more. But when you finish enduring, sometimes you got to celebrate everybody else's season and watch them pass it over while you're getting passed over. And God is checking your attitude while you are in this place of germination. And if you can't hang in the darkness, I'm not going to promote you to the light. Now, here's the interesting thing, and I know, oh boy, I don't have much time left, uh, but um, I wanted to teach this this morning, and I pray you get it, and we get to the good part at some point. I'm already at the good part. Y'all just sitting here, because I, one of the things I want to help the church do is transition from waiting for the high point and hear God all through every point. 
and you learn how to respond to the word of God without being emotionalized. Thank you, Jesus. And that your attention will be remain on the word of God even when I ain't hollering. Okay, okay, because some of y'all check out uh, until, you, you know, until I get revved up and you've missed God's word because you're waiting for the hoop. Um, mm -hmm. uh -huh. I'm calling every spirit of ADD in because you need to learn this. Thank you, Jesus. Now, back, me, now back at the ranch. The code of the seed, watch this, is not alive. The coat of the seed, there's no life in it. The coat can't produce. Okay. <laughs> Just like your flesh does not represent the totality of who you are. Oh, Lord. The essence of you is inside of you. But we spend most of our lives dealing with the flesh. And that's why you wrestle for, or for, for years. That's why we wrestle and that's why we fight. Because all we are preconditioned to do and programmed to do is to deal with our flesh. So we dress up our flesh. <laughs> uh, the only sins that we talk about are sins of the flesh. Y'all ain't saying nothing. You a mangy, dirty dog if you do something in the flesh. And we don't know how to minister to people beyond their flesh. Oh, why y'all not shout now? Only thing the preacher talks about is your flesh. And, and, and the more time you spend on the flesh, the less time the essence of you ever develops. You are worrying about what people say about your flesh. You are afraid of what they are talking about in your flesh. Why y'all ain't shouting now? You were worrying about, did you hear, child, she was doing this? Did you hear he was doing it? All that's, look at somebody tell them, that's all flesh. Because if we could ever get past the flesh, we would deal with the fact, what's going on in, inside of me? Maybe I don't need to talk about what you're doing as much as I need to talk, tell you who you really are. Because maybe if you saw yourself differently, maybe if you could really tap into who God really made you on the inside, then maybe the flesh issue would not be an issue if we would start talking about what's on the inside of you. Maybe we need to talk a little bit more about why you are where you are and what you are doing and then tell you that you are better than that. I need you to go ahead and preach to your neighbor and tell him, I don't care what it is. You are better than that. Oh, I, that was the wrong neighbor. Tell somebody else, write it in the chat. I don't care what it is. I don't care what you have done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care who you've been with. God told me to tell you, you are better. But I'm on death row, but you're better. I've had children out of wedlock, like, but you are better. We're not going to keep talking about who you slept with. Oh, uh, We ain't going to talk about who you going with. That's a silly conversation. And only silly people keep having that conversation. I'm going to preach while I'm at it. Shallow, immature, stupid people talk about people. Who they with. I need somebody to tell me you are greater. I need somebody to tell me who, what God has made. Remind me of who God made me. Stop looking at my flesh. Because you got flesh too. Well, you need some Bible. I see y'all looking. The Bible says, no, no man after the flesh. I need to know you in the spirit. So I can forget what you're doing in the flesh. I need to speak to your spirit. I am preaching to your spirit this morning. Because if your spirit ever gets right, then your flesh will follow. Every time I've had a flesh issue, it was not a flesh issue. It was a spirit issue. And if I get my spirit together, my flesh don't have no problem. Why y'all ain't shouting now? And a whole lot of stuff we call fleshy problems ain't fleshy problems. They're human. 
I ain't got time for that this morning. Some a whole, some a whole, a whole lot of stuff we call it wrong and all that kind of stuff. You just being human. I'm just having a human experience. I'm a spiritual being having a human experience. And yes, Lord, and because my flesh, the coat, yes, Lord, because the coat ain't saved. Help me here. Because the coat ain't got no life in it. Every now and then the coat gets bruised. Every now and then the coat does something that ain't right. Every now and then the coat says something, y'all, Why y'all sitting here. Every now and then the coat says something, goes somewhere, does something that don't please God. But I'm grateful that he don't cut me off in the flesh because he knows what's inside of the sea. Woo! I need you to holler down your road. Say, he knows what's inside of the sea. You see my actions, but God knows what's inside of me. He knows. He knows. And if he, and that's why, that's why he keeps waking you up every morning. Y'all don't know when to shout. That's why you're still here. Because if he was like other people do you, thank you, he would have cut you off a long time ago. Uh, but the reason why you're still here, because he knows that if I can keep them buried long enough, <laughs> thank you, Jesus, if I can keep him, I realize why God didn't take me certain places at certain times, because he knew that I wasn't ready for it. Ah, uh, but when you get ready for it, God will cause that seed the power to produce is never realized until the seed is buried look at your name and say oh, you gotta be buried I know you want to be seen all the time but you need to be okay with being buried uh, I know you want to defend yourself all the time, but you got to be okay with being quiet. Why y'all ain't talking? I, I know you want to get them back, but uh, they ain't worth that. Hallelujah. I'm sorry. They ain't worth They ain't worth the essence of who you are on the inside. They are not worth you because by the time you do all of that, you have lost time. You have lost energy and you have lost your destiny. Just stay buried. Look at your mind. Stay buried. Stay buried. Stay hidden. Stay hidden. Woo! Stay hidden. Stay. stay. Your post tells us you on the ground. <laughs> Your post tells me, tells us you just on the surface. <sighs> but when you're buried, when you're buried with him, <laughs> you don't even hear what's going on on the ground. Because anybody buried underground can't hear what's going on on top of the ground. Yeah. I've never heard a dead man respond to anybody on top of the ground because he's buried. I hope this is helping somebody. In order... For the greatness of God in you to be developed, you must be willing to let something die. My question to us this morning from God is what is alive that's keeping you from living? What's alive in you that's keeping you from living. What? 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 What are you dealing with? What is alive? Is it your thoughts? Your, your emotions? Who is it? What is it that's so alive in you that's keeping you from living? Mm -hmm. you, you can't turn from it because it's always living. It's it's, what is it in you? Is it fear that's alive, that's keeping you from living? God can bless you, and you'd be like, no, that ain't God. That, I'm all right. It's, 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 and, and no, no. That, God can put it in your hand, and you'd be like, no, not me. There's a huge difference between conceit and confidence. 
And most people don't know the difference. And so when you see somebody who walk in confidence, you think they are conceited. Oh, God, because I take care of myself and I have pride in what I look like and how I talk and my, 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 the image I cast. I'm not conceited. I am confident and I am confident in he that have begun a good work in me will perform it. The anointing doesn't make you conceited. The anointing makes you confident because you realize if God ever takes his hand off your life, you have nothing to add. You have nothing to give. So you are confident in the fact that if God's hand is on me, then why am I going to act like it's not on me? What is alive in you that's keeping you from living? Right. Is it anger? Well, the Bible says this. Anger rests in the bosom of a fool. I, I, I need, this, this, this is where I am. I need y'all to shout when y'all hear truth. Let me know y'all heard it. Anger rests in the bosom of a fool. When you see somebody always angry, hateful, vengeful, they are fool. You are fool walking around hating everybody, mad at the world. You're a fool. It's foolish. I don't want to call you no fool. The Bible said call no man a fool. I'm sorry. Sorry, mother. Sorry, I'm sorry. The Bible said call no man a fool. I'm sorry. You are foolish. It is foolish behavior to walk around mad at everything and everybody. Can I tell you something? Everybody ain't thinking about you. Uh, okay. Everybody, you ain't on everybody's mind. Y'all ain't helping me. No, I'm sorry. I know you think so. Let me tell you what I found out. I found out. Folk can be the topic of discussion. And die. And a month later, somebody said, who? Who? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They sh show live. That show live. Now, why you had all this commentary when I was alive? A month later, I don't even matter. Y'all do know with all the media attention of the slap heard around the world, it's seven days later. And is dying. Y'all ain't saying nothing. You know what I'm trying to tell you? You worrying about stuff that's going to die. What's keeping you, what's alive in you that's keeping you from living? I need to announce this while I'm preaching, while I'm thinking about it. I needed a real deliverance in my life. I've been delivered from sin, from the power of the penalty of sin, through the power of the Holy Ghost, through salvation. I've been delivered, and thank God for deliverance, right? I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I know I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. That's not a question. But there was a piece of me that needed to be delivered. My problem was I couldn't get over people. My problem was I needed deliverance, freedom from public opinion. And I kept asking God because it will wear on your self-esteem. It, it, will, it will destroy your securities. You'll become insecure. Come on here, talk. You, you'll start second-guessing yourself. I mean, you will operate only from the praises and the positive opinions of others. That's where I was. And then the Lord showed me something. I said, Lord, I need you to deliver me. Then God, and I said, Lord, please deliver me from this. He said, okay, I will. I said, Lord, please deliver me. He didn't do it. He said, I will. 
Then you know what I discovered? Without lightning flashing and without thunder rolling. So now I got delivered. And I was trying to figure out when. And then the Lord showed me when. When you go through enough stuff. When you've been hurt enough. When you have lost enough. When you've been embarrassed enough. There comes a time where what you think can't matter. Oh boy, this ain't going so good. At some point, what people think about you can't be more important than what God has done for you. I need you to take a moment and just think about one thing that he did for you that nobody else could do. That ain't enough praise in the storefront. I said, I need you to think about one thing that you know you were caught up in and God brought you out. It ain't no rumor. It ain't no lie. You ain't really in it. But God, yes, I said, but God, I said, but God, I said, but God, is there a but God praise in the house? Three, four. That's all. That's all, y'all. I guess, but I need you to turn to your neighbor and tell him there's something. I, there's something he brought me through that I can't tell you about. But all I would tell you is, but God. Something has got to die. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, something got to die. And I ain't waiting till next week. But I'm going to kill it today. Because I got to produce my best life. I'm going to finish this on Tuesday. I ain't going to hold you. But look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, whatever it is, let it die. I said, let it die. If it's fear, let it die. If it's anger, let it die. If it's the disappointment, let it die. If it's malice, let it die. If it's strife, let it die. So what? They didn't apologize. Let it die. So what? They talked about you. Let it die. So what? They're running you down. Let it die. You can't be free till you let that die. Can I tell you something? Your enemy think, well, let me put it like this. What your enemy don't know is they did you a favor. Uh, Your enemies have been used and deputized by God. To bless you. I'm sorry. I just thought about something. Your enemy has been used. They've been deputized by God. To bless you. Because they thought in their killing of you that was the end. That's what they thought. But 
what they didn't understand is when they committed your reputation to the ground, when they committed your character to the ground and said ashes to ashes, they thought that it was it was done. I need you to go at the church, go to Walgreens, go to Walmart, find out where they, they sell Hallmarks. When you send the, when you care to send the very best, buy them a card. If you really mean it, go to edible arrangements. Give them some flowers, give them some candy, and send it to them and just write, thank you. Because what you did made me kill some stuff in me. It ain't, it ain't resurrection. I can't do this yet. But I might as well just go ahead and practice it. They laid them in a bottle tomb. They said it was over. They hung them high. Stretched them wide. Hung his head in the locks of his shoulders and gave up the ghost and died. Took him down, put him in a tomb. Hallelujah. They said it's over for him. But he told him, destroy this temple. But in three days, he lay there all day Friday. He lay there. No, he lay there all day Thursday. He lay there all day Friday. Lay there all day Saturday. But Saturday evening at 6 p.m., he got up, made his bed up, and said, Early. I said, Early. I said, Early. He got up. I said he got up. And he said now, because I live, you, 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 you shall live also. He didn't die alone, but because he lives, I, I can face because I live. You gonna live because he lives. You gonna live because he lives. Say yes, yes. <laughs> I'm, I gotta stop that. That's enough. That's enough of that. Oh yeah. Uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. I know it's all right now. You only on your neighbor and tell him, let it die. Oh, let it die. Oh, 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 let it die. I'm done. Everybody stand to your feet up. Let it die. Let it die. Let it die. Whatever it is, let it die. Whoever it is, let it die. Sometimes that relationship got to die. Because it's killing you. Let it die. That old mentality got to die. You, know, you can't go forward looking backwards. Stop having backward conversations. Stop having yesterday conversations. It is only when you can see no future that you have the right to give up. But every day I wake up, I wake up realizing that this is the day. Not, well, let me say it like, that the Lord has made, not just for me to shout and dance in, but he made this day 
to give me new possibilities. Amen. This day has its own set of opportunities that yesterday didn't have. And the only reason why today won't be productive is because I keep hitching the U-Haul of yesterday and keep dragging it everywhere I went. God's trying to take you to new places that requires new furniture. I don't know who this is for. God's trying to take you to new places that require new friends. It requires a new level of education. It requires a new language. It requires new vocabulary. God's trying to put you in rooms where you can't be talking about them, that, and other. So what do I do? I kill that. How do I live to the new? Get me a dictionary. Y'all quiet. I start reading. Stretch yourself for where you're going. We're not going to keep talking about it. No, no, no. We're going to let that die. Let it die. Let it die. Let it die. Let it die. I keep saying this. I don't know who this is for. I'm speaking to somebody's spirit today. Let it die. We're not talking to your flesh. That's a coat. Just like I take this coat off. Don't have no value. But the essence of who I am does not reside in this coat. And it doesn't matter how much I paid for this coat. Don't matter how much you dress up the outside. The essence of you, lift your hands, let me start. Lift your hands up all the way up. And I don't know what that something is, but you know what it is. And I need you to declare. I need you right now. To pronounce the last rites. We're not at the funeral service. We're at the internment. We're at the internment of your pain. The internment. Of that cycle. Of behavior. We're at the internment of your fear. We're at the internment. Of your anger. Oh, if your hands and open your mouth. Come on, worshipers. You're at the interment. You're at the, you're at the burial site. Open your mouth and put that thing in the ground. I will not live in this place. I will not live in this fear. I will not live in this, this anger. I will not live in this bitterness. No, no, no. I'm going to let this die. Because what's in me got to come out. I need you to open your mouth, people. I don't need to be telling you. I need. I didn't say meditate. I need you to open your mouth. Come on, let that thing die. Father, in the name of Jesus right now, accept the corn of wheat fall to the ground. Die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it produces a harvest. It produces so much more. God, we've been limited. We've been hindered because we have not buried. But today, Lord, we pronounce even now over everything that's not like you in our lives. Ashes to ashes. Dust to dust. You got to go to the pit of hell. You got to go to the place of obscurity. You must go. But you cannot live in my life any longer. And we thank you. We thank you. Now let the praise of God. Let the praise of God. I said let the praise of God. 